Let's play a little game. Maybe you've seen something like this online. I, I've seen a lot of these. It's uh, before they were famous kind of kind of posts, and you have to maybe see if you can guess who the celebrity is before they were famous. And so we're going to do a little bit of that this morning. And just this is crowd participation. This is the one part of the time that you can yell out without any sense of order in, as long as you have the right answer, okay? Uh, you may not have the right answer. So I'm going to show you a picture of a young child, and then you need to tell me who the famous person is, what famous person they are. So we're going to start kind of easy. Go ahead and put the first one up. This is the first one. Who is this? Not Chris Beard. Bill Clinton, that's right, Bill Clinton, is a, that's the first one. You can kind of see the resemblance, okay, the President of the United States. And we got another one up here. Let's see who this one is. Who can guess who this is? Shout it out if you know. Look around the eyes, that kind of gives it away. Yes, yes, we have a winner. It is Albert Einstein. That's the better picture of him there on the right. Okay, so we've got Bill Clinton, Albert Einstein. Okay, let's show the next one. This is the next one. Who, who is this? See if you can figure this one. This is a tough one. If you get this one, you're either a super fan or I don't know what. Anybody have an idea? Let's show them. This is Clint Eastwood when he was a child. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and show another one. This is the next one. Anybody know who this is? No, not President Obama. Martin Luther King Jr. Yep, that's who that is. You're doing good. So far, so good. Okay. What about this one here? Who's this? Boy Scout. I'll give you a hint. He has, well, I'll give you a hint. If he dropped a $100 bill, it would not be worth his time to bend over and pick it up. Bill Gates. Yes, it is Bill Gates. Okay. All right. Here's one for the, you know, like the kids are going, who are these people? Okay. And actually, I kind of hope they don't know who this is, but who is this? Miley Cyrus. Yes, that's, a, that's her post-Hannah Montana era right there. Okay, so that's when she, she was so cute when she was young, right? And then what about this one? Who can guess this one? Who? That is not me, no. What do you think? Have Eleanor Roosevelt as a guess? Anybody know? Let's show them. It's Gerald Ford. Really, it's Gerald Ford. I used that one because he was in a dress, and I wanted to throw you off a little bit there, so that worked. All right, what about this one here? Can you guess who this is? I'll make it a little easier. Give the next one. We'll zoom out a little bit. George W. George w. Bush. That's exactly who this is. Okay, here's another one. Let's give it. Who's this young lady here? I'll give you a hint. She grew up just down the road in Port Arthur, Texas. Ah, that gave it away. Yes, you got that one. Okay, and then here's another one for the younger crowd a little bit. Who is this right here? He was a Mouseketeer. I said for the younger crowd, and Lindy and Janice answered. So, <laughs> if anyone want to know, Janice is a huge Justin Timberlake fan. Okay, all right. Okay, two, two more, and these are pretty easy here. Okay, I like this one. Who is this? Duh, it looks just like him. I mean, there's, a, there's him when he's 12 years old, and that one's there when he's a little older than that. So that's Frank Sinatra. And then one last one, who is this? Albert Hitchcock. It looks exactly the same between those two. <laughs> Some people just never change. They never age. They never change. Hitchcock was a baby until the day he died, it looks like. Well, it's fun to look at pictures like this and, and to see people before they were famous when they were young and kind of see what they looked like. And it's actually difficult, if you think about it, to look at these people and really think about how they're going to grow up and be famous whether you look at the, the picture of Bill Clinton, it's hard to look at that and say, yeah, that guy's going to be president. Or look at Alfred Hitchcock and say, yeah, that's going to be a, a movie director. Or if you look at Janis Joplin, she's going to be a famous singer. You know, and that's really, that's, that's kind of the fun of babies, right? And young children is that you look at them and you don't know what their life has in store. Now, if you're a parent, that could freak you out a little bit probably. But it also is a little bit exciting as well. But, but the reality is, is that you just can't very well look at a young child, look at a baby and know what they're going to be, what they're going to amount to. 
Well, here's some more pictures, too. We've just gotten through the Christmas season, and Christmas has a lot of pictures associated with it. This is one of the pictures we have associated as a Christmas tree, all lit up and decorated. Some of you like to do it neat and orderly. Some of you like to just throw a bunch of ornaments on there and, and uh, anywhere in between. And so that's one picture. Or maybe we have the picture of, of gifts. You know, we have the gift giving that happens at Christmas time. That's something that we think of at Christmas time. And then, of course, one of my favorite parts is the food. I love the Christmas food, and there's a, I don't know how many gingerbread men in my house waiting for you guys to come and consume them and rip off their heads and, and eat them uh, this afternoon. But we love the food, we love the Christmas food, but, but if you think about it, you know, of course we know the reason for the season is Jesus. And, and probably the most common picture that we as Christians associate with the season is this one. It's this picture of the nativity scene. We've got the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph, and you're in the manger. Of course, as we talked about before, even though the wise men probably weren't there, we put them in there with the shepherds and the angel and all that. And so that's kind of the picture that we have, and that's appropriate, because Christmas is celebrating the birth of Jesus. But there's one more Christmas song that I want to cover in our Christmas uh, carol theology series, because it asks a very important question. And the question and the song is this. What child is this? Now this song was written by eight, in the 1860s in England by William Chatterton Dix. It was based on a poem he wrote called The Manger Throne. He wrote these words after being struck by a severe illness and during his survival and his uh, recovery, his, his, his recovery actually bolstered his faith and he wrote this song during his recovery, or this poem. And then he had it put to a traditional English tune called Green Sleeves, which, and I am a really big nerd, I picked out this shirt today with the green sleeves just because of that. But he put, he put that to that tune, and that's the song we know is What Child Is This? Now, of course, as I, as I mentioned, this song asks an important question. What child is this? this? This child that we see in the nativity scene, this, this baby whose birth we celebrate during this time of year every year. And again, it's often difficult to see a picture of a baby in a manger and imagine what he would become. You know, I mean, the answer to the song, though, the answer that this song provides are very scriptural, very theological, uh, but they're also unique because the three verses of this song, they're not just characteristics of who Jesus is, although that would be good, but they're also roles of Jesus that actually have direct impact on our lives as well and how we interact with our God and with Jesus himself. And so therefore the song responds to the question of what child is this with answers that directly affect us as human beings. Starting with verse 1. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch her keeping? This, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him laud, the babe, the son of now the question here is appropriate. What child is this? That's an appropriate question when you think of the details of Christmas morning. Probably you and I have become a little too familiar with the Christmas story to kind of see the, 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 the scene, but, but realize what's going on here. On one hand, you have a child that is sleeping on Mary's lap. You've got a baby that was born into a very poor family. You've got a baby that arrived so suddenly that parents had to make do in a stable and in a manger. You have a baby that was wrapped in cloths and sleeping on his mother's lap. That's the, the scene we have of Christmas morning. But the reality is, is that scene is not really that remarkable. That scene of a baby who was born in a poor family, in an emergency situation, in a, in a stable somewhere, wrapped in cloths, laying on the lap of his mother, it just really isn't very remarkable. Because obviously it was not the only baby ever born to a poor family. It happens every day. It still happens. It happened then. It happens now. This isn't the only baby that was born suddenly and in a strange location. In fact, I did a little search on Google and I found out that this baby was born... Guess what? On Christmas Day, to a poor family on a Philadelphia public transit train. Emergency situation. The mother went into labor on this, this public transportation, on this train, and the policeman holding there helped deliver that baby on Christmas Day. And so that, you know, that, that's not 
not uh, really out of the ordinary. That happens a lot. And certainly this wasn't the only baby, that Jesus being that baby, was the only baby sleeping peacefully on his mother's lap. And so on the one hand, you have this kind of unremarkable story of a baby. But on the other hand, though, we see something a little more remarkable. This baby, as the song says, is one whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping. Now that's something to take note of. Because there have been a lot of babies born into poor families in emergency circumstances, but only one in the history of mankind had a birth announced by angels in this way, let alone an announced to angels to shepherds, by angels to shepherds. That's remarkable. That's interesting. That's amazing. And if you get past the familiarity of the Christmas story, and you think about the peculiar circumstances of Jesus' birth, you may have to ask yourself, what child is this? That on one hand looks and seems completely normal, if not, you know, run of the mill, and then you've got over here this amazing part of the story. How do these two things balance? It just seems out of place. It, it's kind of like this. Um, think, think, of, think of your mind, in your mind about the President Barack Obama, what he looks like. Okay? And let's say that I'm visiting Washington, D.C. And I'm in Washington, D.C. for a tour there. And, I'm, and over here, uh, where I'm at, I see a, a, a kind of a commotion going on. And I see a man that looks a little like Barack Obama. And there's a, there's a bunch of police and armed guards around him. And there's, a, there's flags and, you know, American flags. And there's just a, just a big group around him. And somebody says, hey, look, that's President Obama. I'm probably going to take out my cell phone and take a picture, right? Well, let's say you're in your local friendly Walmart. And you go and you're in the grocery section at Walmart and you see over there is a man that's by himself and he's buying a gallon of milk. And he looks a little bit like President Obama. In fact, he looks exactly like President Obama. And somebody says, hey, look, it's President Obama. Well, I'm guessing that you're probably not going to grab your cell phone thinking you really found President Obama buying milk by himself in your Southeast Texas Walmart. It just doesn't make sense. One context you see the president, it makes sense. The other one, it's like, wait a second, that can't really be the president. That's kind of the scene we have here. This is the, the Son of God being born. I mean, I can see uh, uh, him being born into this majestic and amazing and thunderous and lightning and all these different, you know, just this glorious birth that is just proclaimed to the world and everybody knows about it and fanfare and, and the power of God unleashed. But here we've got the Son of God being born into a poor family in a stable, laying on his mother's lap. That just doesn't necessarily make as much sense. And so we see the circumstances of Jesus' birth and we, we have to ask, you know, who could this be? What child is this? And the song answers with the only possible answer. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. And so we see in this first verse the answer to the question is, that who, what child is this? This child is our humble King. There's one aspect of God that we would have never known if Jesus hadn't been born. We wouldn't have known it as fully anyway. And that's God's unquenchable desire to be near his people. God's unquenchable desire to want to be amongst the people that he, he has created. Now we see it in the book of Genesis how God intended it to be. You've got mankind and God in unhindered contact in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the day with the Lord. Then, of course, we see in Genesis 3 that sin entered the world. And because God is holy, he cannot be in the presence of our sin because that would cause us to be destroyed. And so mankind was therefore separated from God because of our sin. But of course, we know that that separation, it did not quench God's desire to be near his people. Because in the Old Testament, we see that God set up a covenant with the nation of Israel. We see that, that this covenant allowed God to live in the presence of his people in a, in a structure that was called the tabernacle, which was a basically, uh, for the lack of a better term, God's motorhome. He took it, he's he traveling around in this, and wherever the Israelites went, that's where God lived with them. And then you had the temple, that was God's permanent house, where it was built for God to live. And, and so now, God was amongst, he was dwelling amongst his people, but that was not quite how God intended, because there was still the sin issue, there was still the sin problem, but even though God lived amongst his people, he was still separated from his people. 
by the by the structure of the temple, by the structure of the tabernacle, that he could not be right in unhindered fellowship with them. But then came the birth of a baby boy. And an angel told this to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. The angel said, She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so the birth of this humble king showed us that God is with us indeed. John chapter 1, verse 14, I love the message translation that says, The word, Jesus, God, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. Who, we're talking about Jesus saying, Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used by, to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. It's just like Tim said, that Jesus could have just hung out up on the throne of heaven. He could have been there and, and, and said, No, I'm good. I'm going to stick here. I'm going to stay here. But, but what he did is he emptied himself. He emptied himself. He said, I'm not going to hold on to this status I have as the Son of God. I'm going to empty myself, become a man, and walk the stinking, smelling earth. Why? Because he loved us. What child is this? This is the humble king that confirms that God is with us. Verse 2. Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and donkeys are feeding? In Christians fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. Nails, spears shall pierce him through the cross he bore for me, for you. Hail, hail, the word made flesh, the day of the son of Mary. I like this verse because it's almost like the, the writer of the song can't get over the fact that God became flesh and was born in such humble circumstances. You know, he wrote that this previous verse, what child is this, is laying the rest of Mary's lap, is sleeping, all that. And, he says, and then he says, this is Christ the King. And then he comes back and he says, but wait a second. What in the world is he lying in such a situation, such mean estate, in the midst of ox and donkeys? Why, why is he here? Why is this king on this stinky, smelly earth in this situation? And then we see in this verse, and, and we see in Scripture, the answer is simple, that this child is to be an inviting Savior to us. He's an inviting Savior. Emma, can I, can I have your help for a second? Come on up. Where's that? you got a microphone somewhere. Just uh, let me even borrow your microphone. She didn't often do this, so did you? Hold this and you be talking to it. Okay. I want to ask you a question. Let's say you're on a school trip. Have you ever been on a school trip? Okay. Let's say you're on a bus on a school trip. Have you ever been on a bus on a school trip? So far, you can kind of imagine this. Okay. And then let's say, though, that unfortunately that bus is an accident. Okay? And you're going to be okay, we think. But you are immediately life flighted to a hospital. And you're in really bad shape. Okay? Now, you were just with your classmates, you were, in, you, know, that you were on this bus, and now you're in, in an accident, and now you're in the hospital. The question is, do you think anybody will come to the hospital to see you? Yes. You think so? Okay. Who do you think would show up at the hospital? My parents. Okay. Who else? My grandparents okay. and my sister. Now, do you think maybe they'd like maybe go grab a bite to eat and maybe go shopping for good hospital wear and... Would they, you know, go maybe get a new puppy and go shop for a new car? Or maybe watch the a whole series of something on Netflix? Would they do all that before they came to the hospital? No. What would they do? They would drive straight to the hospital. Straight, straight to the hospital. Anybody else you think would come to see you at the hospital? Probably a few friends. Friends? Yeah. Oh, that'd be cool, right? Now, why do you think that family or mom and dad, sister grandparents, friends, why do you think they would rush to the hospital? Because they love me. Because they love me. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Give her a hand for helping out. Because they love her. They care for her. They want to make sure she's going to be all right. They want to do what they can to be there. And then what we see in this song is the writer of this song asks, why this humble king on earth like he is? Why did this king 
why is Philippians 2 right? Why is that? Why did he empty himself? Why did he leave heaven? Why did he come down to earth to be flesh and blood and to move into the neighborhood? Why did he do that? We see the answer in the song. Good Christians fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. See, Christ came to the earth because to be the inviting Savior. And we know that because he did that, but that the, the God is not only with us, but that God is for us as well. That it, because he is the inviting Savior, that he's not just want to, he didn't just come around just to be with us. He came around for a purpose, to be for us as well. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 said this, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And let me tell you, for a world that so is desperate, so desperately broken, so desperately messy, and stressful, and all these other words that you can think of to describe the situation that we live amongst, things like Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. That, that, that's, that's good news. Amen. That's good news. And, and church, I would suggest to you that we need to do a better job of showing the world that God is for us and for them as well. The song puts it this way. Good Christians fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. Nails, spears shall pierce him through. The cross he bore for me, for you. That Jesus left not just to hang out and to move next door to us, but he left with a purpose to not just be with us, but to be for us, and to be for us in the greatest way possible, but to give his life up for us. To be pierced with nails and spears, to give his life on a cross for us. God's for us. That's the way the song goes. So here's why Jesus said it. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. We know that. That's the good one. Here's the other part we have to remember, though, with it. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, God is for us. Christ came to this world. He was born as a baby because God is for us. He didn't come because he said, I'm sick and tired of that stuff that's going on down there. Send my son down there to clean it up. To show them who's boss. That's not what God did. God sent his son so that we may not have per we may not perish, but have eternal life. Because he sent him, his son not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The Apostle John puts it this way. In 1 John 4, 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. God saw the situation that we were in amongst our sin and the, in, in the, the messiness of, of the sin had caused. And he said, I want my son to go down there and take care of this problem. Not because I'm mad at them, because I'm for them. You see, just like Emma's friends and, and, and family would rush to the hospital because they care and love for her, uh, Jesus looked down on this earth and he saw the death and destruction that the, and the, that the wreck of sin had caused and because he loves and cares for us, he rushed down to be with us. i got to get down there, he says. Not only did he come to be with us, he came to be for us as well, again, by becoming the Savior, the inviting Savior on the cross by paying for our sins. And you can bet that he wants nothing more than for those who are in the midst of the destruction of sin to come to him. Second Peter 3, 9 says it this way. The Lord is not sleep slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Those are pretty inclusive words. Not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting everyone to come to repentance. Verse 3. So bring him incense, gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings, let loving hearts enthrone him. Raise, raise a song on high, the virgin sings her lullaby. Joy, joy, for Christ is born, the maid, the son of man. In this final verse, you've got to kind of look behind the, the, the words a little bit, read between the lines a little bit, but the writer comes to the logical conclusion of who this child is and what it means to us. Because if the child is the humble king that showed us that God is with us, which he absolutely is, 
If the child is the inviting Savior who shows us that God is for us, which he absolutely has and done, as it did, and then that means one thing, that if he's the humble king that shows us that God is with us, if he's the inviting Savior that shows us that God is for us, then only one thing can remain, and that means that this child is the demanding Lord that shows us that God is over us. He's the demanding Lord that shows us that he is over us. I have a movie clip that I want to play for you in just a second here. But I want to warn you a little bit. Because when I first saw this clip, I was slightly offended. I was slightly offended because it seems pretty irreverent. It's kind of an irreverent movie clip. I will confess to you that I was also slightly amused because the clip involves Will Ferrell, who is a very funny actor. And the movie, the clip is from the movie Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. And some of you have seen it. I can see by the look on your face. Some of you are thinking, he's going to play that in church. <laughs> but after I saw it, I realized that even though it is a bit irreverent, it, it may be more accurate than what we would like to admit. We have a, I said, we're having a, a few technical difficulties, so the video might be a little, little sketchy, but the audio should be good. So listen and watch this video. Summer's ready! Come on, y'all! Been slamming over this for hours! Dear Lord, baby Jesus, we thank you so much for this bountiful harvest of dominoes, AFC, and the always delicious Taco Bell. I just want to take time to say thank you for my family, my two beautiful, beautiful, handsome, striking sons, Walker and Texas Ranger, or TR, as we call them. And of course, my red hot smoking wife, Carly, who's a stone cold fox. Mm. Also, want to thank you for my best friend and teammate, Cal Naughton Jr., who's got my back no matter what. Shake you, mate. Dear Lord, baby Jesus, we also thank you for my wife's father, Chip. We hope that you can use your baby Jesus powers to heal him and his horrible leg. And it smells terrible, and the dogs are always mm. bothering with it. Mm. Dear tiny infant Jesus. Hey, um, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off putting to cradle, baby. Well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best, and I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say the grown up Jesus, or teenage Jesus, or bearded Jesus, or whoever you want. Dear tiny Jesus, your golden fleece diapers with your tiny little fat balled up fist. He was a man. He had a beard. Look, I like the baby version the best. Do you hear me? I win the races, and I get the money. Ricky, finish the brace. Beard, eight pound, six ounce. Newborn infant Jesus. Don't even know a word yet. Just a little infant, so cuddly, mm. but still omnipotent. Mm. We just thank you for all the races I've won and $21.2 million. Woo! 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 Ow! <laughs> Woo! Now, as I mentioned, this picture, show the next picture. This picture is the one that we associate most with Christmas. The one that's got a baby in a manger. And that makes sense. Again, we're celebrating the birth of Christ. And, and now you and I both know, we know that the baby grew up. When we sing songs about it, we even proclaim that the Savior was born. And when we picture this manger scene, you know, we, we can't really, really, we can't wait for him to grow up and become the humble king. Because having God with us is a blessing, is it not? And we cannot wait for the baby to grow up and become the inviting Savior because having a God for us is, is better than anything else in this world, is it, is it not? But if we're honest with ourselves, our selfish nature would much rather be like Ricky Bobby and pray to the baby Jesus than to the demanding Lord that he became. I think a lot of us, a lot of people in this world do prefer the baby in the manger. The eight pounds, six ounce baby. That's the, that's the Jesus we'd really like to have in our life if we're really honest with ourselves because we like the non-threatening, cute baby in the manger. That's the baby we really like because you know what? If that's the, baby, if that's the Jesus that's in our life, guess who's still in charge? It's not a baby. It's me. It reminds me a bit of a situation I heard about recently. It had to do with a couple of Christian colleges that I'm familiar with. And due to a couple of things going on in the world, recession and all that kind of stuff, over the last several years, the last decade or two, 
a lot of the private Christian colleges, the Bible colleges in the United States have really struggled financially. We've had several colleges that had to cut back and they had to, uh, to make, diff- you know, make some ends meet in different ways. And, they, and some of them have even closed their doors because of the financial hardship that they've been over, under, undergoing. And, and a couple of colleges have, have merged in order to help try to, to remain in place and to, and to continue the mission that they have as Bible colleges. And it was this uh, a college that I knew was pretty familiar with, and they were struggling, and they'd already made cuts, and they were kind of at their wits' end. And so what they did is they approached another college that I'm familiar with to, to, uh, to, to see if they would be interested in a merger. And the leaders of the colleges met, and they went back and forth, and they had discussions, and the discussions looked really good. And then all of a sudden, they fell apart. And come to find out, what happened is that the college that was in trouble financially— what they had said to the college that they were considering merging with is that um, we want to keep our governing board intact and we don't want you to interfere with our business. And so in essence what they were saying is, come give us all of, our mo- all of your money, bail us out of all of our debt, take care of us financially, but the rest of it we'll take care of ourselves. Now, as you can imagine, that doesn't work in the real world. That if there's going to be a merger, if there's going to be financial assistance, if there's going to be a bailout, then there's going to be some accountability. There's going to be uh, uh, some some partnership there. There's going to be some loss of power and loss of control. And you know what, church? I think sometimes we often view Christ in a similar way. We find ourselves in our sin. We find ourselves in the mess of our life. And we find ourselves in, in what's going on. And we just say, okay, God, save me from this situation. Save me from my sins. I want you to bail me out here, God. And God says, you got it. I will bail you out. I will meet you where you are. I will take the, your sins from you. I will pay the price for your sins. And then when we get to that point, then we say, oh, great, God, thanks. Now, if I need you again, I'll let you know. If there's anything else you can do for me, God, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll get in touch with you. And, and let me tell you, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. But here's the good news that we have. That Christ is not the demanding Lord at the expense of the humble king and the inviting Savior. Let me say that again. Christ is not the demanding Lord at the expense of of the humble king and the inviting savior. Just because he is a demanding Lord, just because he becomes demanding, just because God is over us does not negate the fact that God is with us and that God is for us. You see, Christ is the demanding Lord for, I I think, a couple of reasons. First of all, he deserves our submission. He deserves our glory. You know, I think I'm convinced that when we realize the magnitude of what Christ has done for us, that making him our Lord is much easier when we grasp the gift he's given to us. And I think a lot of our issues as, as, as far as submitting to Christ and to, to making him our Lord as well as our Savior is that we really haven't grasped the great gift that he gave us. We, we, we really haven't grasped the debt, the, the, the magnitude of the debt that our sin was. We've not grasped what we deserved when we are in our sin. I think when we see a picture of that, when we start to see that through the eyes of God, that we are left with no choice but to rejoice. We're left with no choice but to rejoice that Christ has saved us and that we want to submit to him and give him glory. But I think that the second reason that he is a demanding Lord is that what he demands is in our best interest. Christ demands to be at the center of our lives because he knows that we were created for that very relationship. He knows that that when we were created, if everything was to go as planned, that Christ would have been at the center of everything we do every second, every hour, every day. And he knows that if we had just followed God's order and had Christ at at the center of our lives every second, every hour, and every day, then we would have avoided the mess and the destruction and all the stuff that comes along with sin. And Christ demands to be the Lord of our lives because he knows that Isaiah 55, 8 is true, that says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. (laughs) That means that the the, the way God thinks and the way God uh, understands doesn't really match up with our understanding and our ways as selfish human beings. And so therefore we need to allow God to to, to show us 
his ways, to show us his thoughts. And Christ uh, demands, and by the way, the more we align our ways and our thoughts with the Lord, the better off we're going to be. And Christ demands to be Lord of our lives because he knows that the more we obey him, the more we will experience what Psalm 119, 103 says. It says, how sweet are your words to my taste, how are sweeter than honey to my mouth. I got to tell you, I think a lot of times the world around us, and even us, we don't look at God's word and say, how sweet that is. We look at it and say, man, what a buzzkill. Man, this is, I got to do this stuff. I'm, and we're viewing it the wrong way. We're viewing it as a, as a, as a checklist. We're viewing it as a rule book. When, when God says, this is, your, this is the book of life. This is the way that you can find life through Christ. And the more we live by the ways and thoughts of the Lord, the more we're going to be able to get up in the morning and proclaim that because we will experience the protection of a God that is demanding, a demanding Lord, a God that is truly over us, but a God that's also for us and with us at the same time. So now it's December 28th, and the whole world has celebrated the birth of Jesus. And as we reflect on the season, and as we take down our decorations, and as we move into the new year, the world around us, church, is still wondering, what child is this? What child is this? And so it's up to us to proclaim that the baby that caused all the commotion of the past week, that he grew up. And then he grew up to become the humble king that shows that God is with us, that he wants to be near us, regardless of our messiness and our sin. He wants to be near us, and he's done everything he could to get close to us. We need to proclaim to the world that he grew up to become the inviting savior to show us that God is for us, that God is not some cosmic killjoy waiting for us to screw up so he can zap us with a bolt of lightning. That God is looking down in pain because we don't follow him. Knowing that if we just submit ourselves to him, that our lives would be so much more in harmony with what he created. And of course, he grew up to be the demanding Lord to show us that God is over us. And, and this is the good news. This is the good news that brings great joy. And so we shall rejoice. Let us rejoice in that great news as we stand and as we sing this song together this morning. What a child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap this sleeping who angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels see. Haste, haste to bring Him all the babe, the Son of Such mean estate where ox and donkeys are feeding. Good Christian, fear for sinners here. The silent word is pleading. Next fear shall pierce him through the cross be born. Oh.
God, I pray that we will engage this world with the good news of your Son, with the, with, with the fervor that's, that's a thousand times as strong as the energy and excitement we had for this Christmas season. God, I pray that you will just allow us to, to take this good news of, a, of the fact that you are with us, that you are for us, and you are over us, and that when those three things go together, we find in Christ such a wonderful Savior, the Savior that we need in our very lives each and every day. God, I pray you'll bring us more strength and boldness as we proclaim this to the world. I pray, Lord, that you'll go with us now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.